Okay, it's time. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Kleinen from Netflix. I'll be chairing this session. We have uh, four good presentations for you today. Um, and we'll, we'll start off with uh, Uzbolt uh, from Mobicom, who will talk about asymmetric routing and BGP traffic engineering challenges. So, Uzbolt. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> so, hello, everyone. I will talk about uh, our historical experience about the internet symmetric routing and BGP traffic engineering challenges. So, firstly, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Oswald, and I'm IP network engineer of Mobicom Corporation, and I have 10 years experience about the IP network and also a program committee member of MNOG. So, little introduce for Mobicom Corporation. So, Mobicom Corporation is a mobile operator and service provider in Mongolia, also a subsidiary company of KDDI Group. So, in my presentation, three timelines. Uh, first one is early, it's the, about uh, 2010. And mid loan is 2012, and now means the 2017. So, in early, please uh, look at our topology. And this one is our gateway routers, and we have connected to three region internet gateways USA, Asia, and Europe. And bottom one is our customers. So how we controlled our trafficking early? Inbound traffic, we used a separate advertisement for our BGP. For example, a customer A advertised to only USA, and customer B advertised to only Asia, and customer C advertised to only Europe. Then these customers' incoming traffic come from their advertised gateways. So for outgoing traffic, we use the policy-based routing. So policy-based routing is the very weird. <laughs> we doesn't use the, our routing table. So in this case, there is no asymmetric routing for outgoing traffic. Example for customer A, outgoing traffic goes through USA and incoming traffic goes through also USA. And it's the easy for traffic engineer for engineers. But it's the very wrong, wrong for us because customer A wants to Asia want to customer connect to Asia, but it's the maybe 300 millisecond. So why we do that? It's the some possible reasons we have. Uh, our, our upstream is capacity too slow, too low and we, doesn't have any CDN servers. And also we have faced uh, some issues about uh, high delay and web browsing too slow. So also, no redundancy. One of gateway will fail. We reconfigure it manually by advertisement and PBRs and also a policy-based routing issue. Then we expanded uh, our gateways and also installed uh, some CD in uh, our network. Then we advertised all customers to all gateways. Also, we removed the PBRs. But in this case, we only fixed the uh, our redundancy and P 
PBR's issues. So still the high delay problems is still there. So our BGP configuration is like a default. We need to some policy apply to our BGP configuration. So then we used the APNIC and RIPE database and we collected their ACE numbers and we make the big ACE path lists for outgoing traffic. So this one is a little example for Cisco IOS and Cisco IOS XR. So that policy applied to our routers, and that's the Asian is and matches in our Asian gateways. Then traffic goes through Asia, and also European Asians match the European gateways. That's the goes through European gateway, and didn't match Asians goes through USA. <laughs> so that uh, is part list and some specific prefix lists lines there are about uh, 700 lines in our routes configuration. That's the complex for engineers troubleshooting. So inbound traffic, we use the ASPAT prepend, but ASPAT prepend is not efficient for us because ASPAT prepend impacts the all inbound traffic for customer. And also we have connect to our upstreams and also connect to destination sites, content providers, but it's the wasting time and long time conversation. Often it's the results unsuccessful. So today we use the BGP communities uh, or upstream spread finite BGP communities and BGP communities very powerful and useful and helpful for us for BGP traffic engineering. So how we use the, our upstream is BGP community for outgoing traffic. So this example for telecarriers and this example for entities, we connect to telecarrier in USA and Europe. Also we connect to entity in Asia. So predefined BGP communities. We use the origin communities, Europe here and Europe customer applied in our European pop and also we use the US peer, US customer and our U US gateways. And also same like uh, an entity, origin community. So this one is uh, applied configuration for our router, example on Cisco IOS XR. Uh, incoming traffic, we use the predefined action community for our upstreams. And is, is the, yeah, this one is some example for applied configuration. So this one is some challenges today in the origin community. And this origin community is uh, duplicated in uh, two regions. Uh, actually, this host is located in Asia, but Telia says this one is European European customer, but entity also says that this one is Asian customer. So we uh, check that and fix that. 
before it was uh, 200 millisecond, and we check it. The, the, that one is the, goes through must be goes through Asia. That then we check it and fix it to change the path. Then this one is 100 millisecond. Also, some good example for us, that's the World of Warcraft's US server. Uh, that US server located in USA West side, but US servers incoming traffic goes through New York and Europe and then Mongolia. The, this one is the 200. 44 milliseconds, then we used the, the Kix New York Exchange BGP community. We used the do not advertise to Blizzard, that community, and then traffic goes through our U USA gateway, and the latency decreased by 200. It's the little improvement for gaming service. Also, this one is the kicks looking class output. Mm, we use the, this BGP community. And also some example for mega I advantage network. So this one is go, incoming traffic goes through USA and then back to Mongolia. It's the 200 millisecond, and we use the BGP community do not advertise all Asian peer, but it seems like it uh, doesn't work. So we use the more specific BGP community that's the do not advertise to China Unicom. So uh, Hong Kong Mega goes through China Unicom, and China Unicom goes through USA Italia. That's why the millisecond too high. And we do not advertise this community, then back to optimal path. So this one is also Telia's looking class output and our monitoring output. So finally, uh, very complex for fixed uh, symmetric routing without uh, BGP community, especially inbound traffic engineering. So because some action needed to destination side and our upstreams. For outgoing traffic, you can control using anyway. At least uh, you can use the static routes. So PGP communities to very quickly help the fix asymmetric routing. In internet exchange part, um, bilateral peering can help to improve stabilizing your routing. So that's the, our experience. Thank you. Any question? Thank you, Zbog. Any questions for, oh. Uh, as usual, please state your name. And, sure. and uh, I'm Tom Paseka from Cloudflare. Um, out of curiosity, why didn't you use NTT Transit in the US and Europe as well? Um, because that will make the inbound balancing very easy because they will simply hot potato for you. So that way you don't need the communities to balance between the providers. So you mean before, why you didn't use that? Yeah. So before we have connect to, not to NTT and Telia, mm. before we have connect to China Telecom and China Unicom, but we have never seen the BGP communities. Yeah, um, because if you connect to the same provider globally, mm -hmm. they, they will hot potato the traffic to you. 
So that way you don't need to worry about tuning like the non-European traffic to go through because it'll simply go through the closest path to you always. So mm -hmm. as, as a tip, that's a, that's a good thing to do is, is connect globally um, and allow them to hot potato the ingress traffic to your network. Okay, thank you. To add to that, is, it, is, it, is some of the consideration for upstream diversity or to, to, to uh, Tom's point? You're, you're, you're looking for, Tom was referring to uh, uh, having a single provider to make the asymmetric ah, routing oh, a little okay, bit easier, okay. but I, uh, in your case, it might be other considerations for multiple upstreams. Yeah. yeah. I think it's the <laughs> not the my decision. Yeah. <laughs> there are multiple uh, considerations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other uh, questions for Uzbol? Okay, thank you, Bolt. It was very uh, good operational uh, sh sharings. Okay, uh, next up we have Anurag from uh, Hurricane Electric. who will be talking about observations from the routing diff. So. Uh, can I have the wireless one? So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Anurag, I work at Hurricane Electric. Uh, this talk is about routing diff. With routing diff, I mean uh, looking at a few providers, entire routing table of few providers, and doing a difference to find what's the difference in the routes. Are there some routes missing, or there are some extra routes in some providers, and trying to make some logic out of it. So the objective of uh, this small study, which we did uh, back in December, was just comparison of the routing table across various networks. Why we are doing that is just to find the reason of uh, if, there are, uh, if there is difference in number of routes, is it significant or not? And what's, what, what, are, what are the reasons which might be causing that difference? So uh, before I get on to the numbers and study, I'll quickly go through brief description of, of how things should be in ideal way, and then try to see if they are or not. So large numbers carry similar number of routes that we already know. It should be quite similar. There can be difference of some routes, but it should be almost similar. Route announcements can be limited by BGP community. The previous speaker uh, quite nicely explained that in detail. So there can, be, uh, there can be a chance of a difference in certain number of routes across provider if BGP communities are used. And eyeball, tra eyeball networks, they try to steer traffic uh, using more specific. That can again result in a difference in number, number of routes. But then there is a counter to most of these points, which is large number of carry, while, uh, while large number of carry similar number of routes, there is a visible difference of significantly high number of routes across large backbones. Uh, what's that number? I'll get into, into the numbers in, in upcoming slides. Uh, while the routing announcement can be limited by BGP community, but again, the number of uh, routes visible should be similar. Why? Because if the route is reaching, say, a default free zone, it, should, it cannot cause a difference in a few thousand routes difference. So taking from the example from previous slides, if a network in Mongolia is, is avoiding announcement to say provider one and, and uh, just announcing or provider two, provider one is still going to get those announcements from provider two. It's not going to black hole the traffic. So that can't explain the situation. And again, the same thing for the third point, which is eyeball networks announce more specifics, sure, but those more specifics should reach the globe. They should reach to all of the providers, at least the default free zone. So it should not be the case. Networks which we considered in this study, AT&T, CenturyLink, actually it's, uh, it's the older one, which is the Global Crossing AS3549. Uh, we did not use the, the, the more popular one, 3356. Uh, I'll get on that why. Um, Cogent, GTT, Hurricane Electric, KPN, NTT, Sprint, and Verizon. So uh, we tried to pick these networks based on certain criteria. And the criteria is these are the large networks by size and reach. Uh, you don't want to pick a very small provider because that may be more affected by more specifics. If you try to pick networks in or near the default free zone, you can expect to have similar uh, view of the routing table. Uh, for all these networks, full routes were visible on RIPE RIS as well as Oregon route views. Uh, most of other so-called transit-free networks, as they are with the Wikipedia list, 
uh, were either not in uh, uh, Oregon route views or they do have a session with Oregon route views, which is down from priority years. And uh, with RIPE RIS also, it's, um, it seems like uh, probably they have changed policy at some point. In initial days, they were, uh, they were getting uh, routes only belonging to those networks, while now it seems like many other networks are announcing full table to RIPE RIS. So it's, it's kind of mixed. For these specific networks, full routes were visible, but I did saw many large providers where uh, full routes were not visible on the RIS, so it made no sense to take it uh, in, the, in the study. So we just, we just selected these networks. And uh, the routes uh, in the default fee zone without a no export should ideally reach everyone else. That's, again, based on our understanding of, of how things work in the world. Uh, I'll explain uh, on the downstream picture in next couple of slides. So the thing is, how BGP routes propagate? Let's try to understand, and then I'll, I'll get on why uh, it's important to pick certain networks and not pick networks on the edge. Here's an example. You have three networks. So you have network blue connected to a route collector. This can be a RIPE RIS or Oregon route views or any other collector. You have network red and network green connected to it. So it's going to inject routes for both. Now. If you are sitting here, you will see that blue has a relationship with red and green. This would be visible on, on various tools, including bgp.he.net or stat.ripe or, or various other, other similar tools. Let's make it slightly more complicated. You've got a bunch of other networks behind it. So you've got yellow behind red, and you also got purple, and you also got green. So now purple connects to this, this side of the network, and it also connects to the green. In this specific scenario, because blue will only export the best path, it's not going to export the paths which are not best and not selected in its, in its forwarding table. It just won't see the relation which, is, which exists over here because the short AS path towards purple is via blue, green, and purple. It's not via this path, right? So instead of seeing this vision, the route collector will just see this vision. In real, there is a relationship over here, but it won't be visible. And this, this also uh, comes in many cases when uh, many of my, uh, my, my friends from other networks tell me that not all their peers are visible on our tool. It's, it's, it's precisely because of the point that uh, if routes are not exported and if best paths are selected, uh, you won't really see them. So uh, an advanced warning before proceeding, lots of numbers are hit. So if you want to have some sleep, go ahead. So uh, at the time of the study, total IPv4 prefixes, which we saw, uh, were something around 800,000 plus in the numbers. Prefixes with limited visibility was 34,800. So close to 35,000 prefixes in the global routing table, they were not visible on all these providers. They were, visible, they were either missing in one or more than, more than one provider. That's almost 4.34% of the, of the routes in, the, in, the, in here. That's, that's pretty high number. So um, as I was uh, looking at the raw data, I realized some of the people were exporting slash 30, slash 28s to the route collector. So I ended up in first uh, putting a slash 24 lens. So it doesn't make sense to you know say a provider one is missing a slash 30 while the provider two is having slash 30. Well, that's the problem of provider two. That's not pro problem provider one. So we go through a slash 24 lens. This lands up with, uh, instead of 800, uh, 800 and then 3,000, you go to, uh, you, you reduce it by a few thousands. Now, you, instead of 4.34, you're looking at 4.31% of routes with the limited visibility. As uh, many, of in the many engineers in the room might have already noticed that uh, uh, some networks are filtering based on RPKI, so that can be a, that can be a possible reason, so I also, uh, try to sort it in, in terms of how many of prefixes out of 34,000 have invalid ROAS. So the prefixes with the invalid ROAS is somewhere around 4,000, so that still does not explain 30,000 plus odd prefixes where either they have a, a valid ROA or whether they have no ROA created at all missing from these networks. Here's the number for the missing number of routes. So we look at uh, 7018 with something around 4% route missing from, from, the, from the total set of routes, which are visible across all. 174 missing 3.98, 3.62, and so on. Uh, we are missing much lesser number of routes, which is a, which is a cool thing, I must say. Uh, why it's so, I'll, I'll probably uh, get as we, as we proceed. But a, a high, number of, uh, uh, high number of routes can be uh, likely due to large large amount of direct peerings, possibly. 
Here's the case of, uh, of, of countrywide uh, limited visibility. So we saw out of the entire list, somewhere around 5,000 plus routes, which accounts for 16% of this list were from Turkey, which were missing there. Then Brazil, 11%, uh, Germany, 9%, US, 8%, and so on. So it's a pretty diversified uh, set of countries. It's not as if just routes in Asian region are missing across these providers or, or, or region in US. Or, so it's just kind of diversified in that sense, which again points to that it's not, it's not something specific uh, a set of people are doing. Some of the missing routes in AS7018. Uh, so these were the routes which we saw which were missing in 7018. Uh, the interesting thing here is RPKI status was invalid for all these. So it's quite, uh, it's quite logical why uh, 7018, which is at and is missing these routes, while some other networks which are not uh, filtering as yet are having it. Then goes for uh, 174. Uh, we did look for RPKI status here as well. Some had valid, some had invalid. These routes just happened to miss uh, from, from 174. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a pretty long list as, as, I, as I started in the start. Then with 3257, the, the picture seems tilted to me for some reason. Huh? Then 3257. AS286. Uh, with AS286, it's important to point out that just around the time when I was looking around, they were working on, on, on doing the, doing the, dropping the RPK invalid. So I had a feeling that uh, some of their routers were dropping invalids at that time, while not all. And I think later they did announce that they are dropping now. So possibly some reason can be because I, based on the entire list, when I saw a large part were the invalids, while there are still some, uh, some valid ones missing in the list, as, as you can see over here. AS2914, uh, most of them with no invalids or with no RPKI ROAS at all, uh, missing in the table. 1239, no specific relation as, as you might see here. 701, which is uh, Verizon. This is uh, something interesting around Verizon and Sprint, which I'll, I'll get to that in, in a few minutes. So uh, top 10 origin ASNs, with, which had this limited visibility, these were the networks which were actually impacted, where they were hoping and expecting that they would have global reachability while they were missing the global reachability. So the first network here comes is, is the TTNet from TR. This, is, this was a rather absurd case, and it's, it's not really a case for the study. The reason why they had limited visibility was they, they were just, um, they, their routes were just visible on uh, Hurricane Electric, AS6939, as a peer they did not had any transit relationship with any other network in the world. So it's quite expected that they would be missing other, other routes. Uh, beyond that, all these cases are, are not, uh, cannot be easily explained. Uh, all these other, other, uh, other networks do have, uh, did have valid transit at that, at that point of time and were not visible uh, across all the providers. So the network from, uh, from DE, uh, the the Kabil uh, Dutch land that was uh, there nine percent of the prefixes were just missing from the global table somehow. So possible reasons for this difference in number of routes, as I already said, um, RPKI based filtering they would be dropping somewhere close to four thousand routes. So you can easily assume that four thousand plus routes would be would, would differ at this point of time uh, across across the backbones which are filtering versus which are not filtering. The other comes is the is the other important thing, which is IRR based filtering. So networks which are filtering based on IRR, uh, we are doing that actively. Would be filtering certain networks, while there are certain networks which are not filtering based on IRR. Uh, in IRR as well, some networks filter just based on the route objects, while some follow the entire AS set chain. So they would expect that you have a valid route object and your and your AS number is in the upstream AS set and so on until it reaches those networks. Uh, route announcement by sensitive networks with no export. There were a couple of cases here with the no exports with the Anycast networks, although it feels like they probably uh, were not sure what they were doing because that can't be the case. Why they would cause a, a black hole, uh, it would cause a black hole unless there's a covering prefix which wasn't there in few cases. Delays due to BGP convergence. Uh, this was the case with the many of the networks from India, Nepal, and Bangladesh in our list. Uh, it seems like at the time we were, we were doing this study in, in a period of four to five days, 
Uh, one of the upstream providers in that region, AS9498, was having instability around that time, and they were flapping, and that was causing convergence issues. So a large set of their downstream customer also came, came in, the, in the list. Well, they just have a fine reachability after that. So I did a recheck in January. They just had pretty, pretty much okay reachability. Then comes the misconfiguration. As I said, in case of one specific network, they uh, had only one peer and no transit at all. So make sure you understand that what is a peer and what is a transit, there is a difference. Uh, peer in BGP is, is just a peer, but peer in the transit peering relationship is, is much different. And of course, BGP filtering. So some networks uh, we noticed were, were the cases where they were missing on opening the downstream filters. So these were the cases where certain new prefixes were announced. Uh, out of the 30,000 plus, around uh, 200 plus prefixes were very recently announced. And it seems like there was a case where they might have asked their upstreams to open filters. Some would have opened and accepted those, some might not have. Some miscellaneous interesting things. Uh, some of the large operators, we notice this includes a network from AS, uh, AS 18101. They created, uh, uh, they created ROAS for their large prefix set, and uh, they missed the fact that they, were, they gave chunk of their uh, prefixes to their downstream. So let's take, for ex example, they had a slash 16. They created a ROA for slash 16 with a max length of slash, slash anything, maybe slash 24. And with their own origin in the in the ROA. And they were giving a bunch of slash 22s for slash 16 to some of their downstreams to announce them. So all those cases just create a invalid ROAs uh, in the RPKI check, so they are missing from, uh, from, from various networks who are filtering. Then bad operational practices, like as I was saying, in case of one specific uh, network from South Asian region, they were probably moving lots of prefixes from one link to other link without having a covering link. And uh, that was that was causing uh, causing the convergence issues to to you know um, in, in this in this data. Then comes the interesting part, which is around 454 routes from uh, one of the one of the uh, Chinese network. A oops, one of the Chinese network AS45090 were missing only from Verizon and Sprint. Uh, as I noticed that, I started looking more into the uh, routes specifically from China, which are missing in, in these two networks. It seems like there's actually a high number. So around 1,000 routes out of entire 30,000, they belong to China. And this, it, it seems like they're not at all in 701 and 1239. And ROAs were OK. Either they were not present or they were, they were, they were valid. It's not uh, RPKI-related rejection. Uh, an interesting thing here was, while these routes were missing, these were not the routes belonging only to, say, uh, the NI NIR in China, like CNNIC. There were cases of large uh, American uh, multinationals which, moved, which, which, are, which have a office presence in China, which were using their prefixes. Uh, and those prefixes were coming from Erin region, and they were also missing in that data. So it seems like the, 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 this kind of missing relationship was not specifically with, with the IPs from where they are coming. It was based on IPs from where they were originated. Just uh, 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 um, an example of how routing was going from uh, for, for this one of the specific network where the highest number of routes were missing. So a large number of routes here uh, end up in merging to 41, uh, this 4134. And uh, from 4134, it goes to rest all. There is relationship uh, present there. So we do see relationship with, with, the, with networks like, say, uh, 1239 or 701. But somehow, 1,000 routes were decided to be filtered. Uh, and these were not only the routes for specifically for the country, like for an IoT project or anything of that sort, which was which maybe they might be trying to isolate. It just seems like maybe a misconfiguration or something which can't be explained. Um, some of these routes which were missing, uh, I, I'll post a list somewhere with all these 30,000 plus routes, and you can you can look into it if, if you're interested and if you think your route might be there. Here's a quick lookup from uh, Sprint Looking Glass for another route. It's just not visible. I did this lookup just uh, two days ago. It's still, it, uh, even after you know, three months, it's still not visible. So it seems like uh, some kind of permanent misconfiguration or, or something of that sort. 
So uh, some conclusions, what operators, operators should do for global reachability, ensure you have proper IRR hygiene. With IRR hygiene, I mean to say, make sure that you create valid route object. If you have uh, IP space from Appenix, go and create it in, in, the, in, the, in the Appenix IRR. If you have, uh, if you have prefix allocations from, uh, uh, from, from Erin, go and create it with Erin and so on. Or maybe use something like R, RDAP or, or RDB, whatever works for, for you. Uh, make sure you uh, create AS set. If you have downstream customers, maintain an AS set with the members of your, of your downstream in the AS set and pass that AS set to your upstream. Your AS set must be in your upstream's AS set and so on until you, you find a reasonably large provider in, in the chain. Ensure RPKI hygiene. Uh, there is still a large number of invalids in RPKI, not because of uh, origin, but because of the max length. A lot of people end up in creating ROAs with much shorter max length, and then they try to deaggregate, and then it just it just catches up and, and gets missing from large number of networks. If you are load balancing uh, traffic across multiple providers, always make sure that you have a covering prefix. So if you have maybe a, in an example, say in IPv4 or slash 18, and, and, and you are trying to uh, announce more specific slash 20s, make sure you always announce slash 18 on more than one provider at least. And then try to steer steer the traffic. Uh, somehow I, I've seen a lot of providers not doing that and uh, just deaggregating all the way to 24 and then jumping 24s around, which which results in in many of these problems where when links are being moved, you'll just have no uh, no visibility whatsoever. Know the difference between your peer and transit. Don't assume your peers to be transit. Um, we happily peer with everyone, but our peering is not same as transit. Transit is a different relationship. Uh, remember that. That's about it. Any questions? Any questions for Anurag? Uh, thanks, uh, Anurag. They, um, um, just out of my curiosity, for some of the, a lot of the research that you had, findings that you had, have you uh, for any of the suspected misconfigs, have you contacted any of these, some of these things that... I, I tried contacting where there were um, uh, very interesting cases where there was a clear difference of routes per ASN. Of course, I did not contact, say, someone like yeah. uh, 1299 who was dropping or 701 it was dropping on Windrise. There's nothing, you know, it's quite obvious there. Uh, I did contact, I did not hear back for South Asian Network. I did hear they were having some instability, so that was that was causing a lot of routes to, you know, come and go away in the table. So depend, depending on the time when you are looking, when you are looking at the snapshot of the, of the risk, you can, you can find the issues. Yeah, it's just, uh, it just seems like some of the examples you had, like 15%, like those top ones, how is it that they don't, you know, try to look more into it themselves, or why is it not a noticeable issue for them, or... I think somehow maybe, it's, uh, it's with, the, with the global reachability, we have uh, an understanding, and for most part, that understanding is okay, that uh, whenever you announce routes to your upstream, they are visible globally, so people do not end up in, in rechecking that for, for most part. And for many other commercial networks, they always try to target uh, network reachability uh, based on the amount of traffic they have. So if there is an eyeball network, they'll probably try to ensure their good reachability with someone like Netflix or Google or Facebook instead of looking at what far off networks are, are, are seeing. That's right. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Anurag. Let's uh, give him a round of applause. Okay, next up we have uh, Kentaro Gotosan from Wasade University um, in, in conjunction with research with JP Nick. So he's gonna talk about uh, detecting route advertisements of unallocated IP addresses. Gotosan. So, uh, hello, I'm Kansara Gosso from, uh, yeah, just he, uh, just like he introduced me, uh, was it a university student, which did a lot, and I major in uh, machine learning theory. And I currently work at JPNIC as a member of Root Research Expert Team, and today I'm giving you a short presentation titled Detecting Root Announcements of Unassigned IP Addresses. So, so here is the brief summary of my presentation. So 
So our purpose is to better understand the reality of unexpected route announcements. And what we exactly did was simply comparing IPv4 for routes with IPv4 addressable in JPNIC. And as a result, we found three different route announcements, which are in detail three separate slash 24 networks. So I'm now introducing the related works of my research. So research about unallocated prefixes from RILs already exists. So these five received the uh, IP prefixes or ACE numbers from IANA, then they allocate to the respecting NIRs or ISPs or end users. But uh, not all the resources are always distributed and the rest are pooled at RIL. And these are unallocated addresses, so it, they're not supposed to appear in any actual routes since there's absolutely no end users assigned to any of this RIL pooled addresses. And moreover, we can even see the RIL allocation progresses at this FTP site offered by APNIC. And even misannounced address spaces and ACE numbers are available at these two links. Uh, so we've come through the fact that unallocated prefixes from RILs are already open to the public. But oh, what about NIL pool addresses? So now I'm introducing all the stakeholders in my research. So first we have JPNIC, which, which first allocates to a portion of its prefixes to JPNIC and NIR in Japan. Then JPNIC further allocates to ISPs in Japan, then ISPs assign their prefixes to end users, or JPNIC directly assigns to end users. Then, uh, just as all the RIOs do, JPNIC also has a pool of unused addresses, which we refer to as unassigned here. Then somebody out there somehow uh, steals or simply, I think this is mostly the case, misconfigure one of these uh, pool addresses here, ABCD slash 24 in this slide. And then being an unexpected or possibly illegitimate origin AS, it announces this ABCD slash 24 into the next hop. And what happens is, I think you can easily imagine eight, uh, the BGP routing system is based on honesty, so it's easily spread to other networks. And eventually, uh, NIRs like JPNIC or any route monitoring researchers or uh, yeah, researchers can easily see this unassigned addresses being announced. So just before moving on to the details of my research, I'd like to mention one thing about the JPNIC pool addresses that before 2003, so any NIRs were allowed to uh, hold resources allocations for further allocations to ISPs in the economy. So just because we have a pool of unused addresses, it does not necessarily mean we're Stock, we're stocking the, we're stocking the prefixes for no goddamn reason. And now JPNIC forwards each allocation request from the local ISPs to APNIC each single time. So I believe that, with only a few exceptions, there basically is no chance of being uh, new addresses being added to this, uh, new addresses anymore. So back to today's main topic. So this is how we confirm the, the existence of this unassigned IP addresses in routes. So we, take, we took uh, parts of unassigned prefixes at JPNIC database and search it on the, uh, the JPNIC Whois system, and it says no match as displayed here, but when we search the exact same prefix on the ripe start, uh, which I think all you know is a uh, rate monitoring system offered by RIPE NCC, it says it, it is visible at exact match, so it, there actually is something like this. And now our hypothesis, well, not a hypothesis, but what we confirmed is that unassigned IP networks are now in the internet, so maybe unnecessary, but if you take review of it, uh, the situation, the APNIC first allocates to JPNIC, then JPNIC further allocates or assigned to ISPs and users, but this green part 
which uh, theoretically not supposed to appear in any actual route, are, are actually uh, announced as a legitimate route in the internet. So now overview again. So we compare the IPv4 routes with IPv4 address pool in JPNIC. Then we detect the unassigned networks announced as routes. And finally, we search for details on the route monitoring system. So, so this is how I implemented detecting unexpected, unexpected route announcements by Python. So it's just a simple script. We take the announced IP prefixes, which is route information. And on the other hand, we have unassigned IP addresses. Um, we take the logical end of these two to extract the announced and unassigned prefixes in Japan. Now the de data details we use. For announced IP prefixes, we use uh, files downloaded from right risk, right routing information service. And each file contains around 800,000 announcements, and its size is equivalent to around 15,341,353 slash 24 networks. And the one we used was for Japan, so uh, its name is RCC06. Uh, so it collects route updates announced by JPAX members. And for unassigned IP addresses, we simply calculated this from JPNIC database on the 10th of December last year. And its size is equivalent to uh, 1,497 slash 24 networks. And needless to say, just as this says IPv4, there is no IPv6 included in here, and it is not open to the public. So now I'm introducing the requirements and links. So for reading root information in JPNIC, uh, database CSV, we use pandas, which is quite famous, so I'm not explaining this. But for extracting an analysis and unassigned IP addresses, these two, net address and IP address, uh, IP address, are the essential ones, specifically this net address, because it has the function of IP set, which enables an easy calculation of set difference or intersection of two IP prefixes. Now, uh, we look at the overview of how we verify the, re the detected networks. So we first detected three unassigned networks announced in route information, as I've already stated in the summary. So we, for those, we sourced those on ripe start for details. So if you enter any IP address, prefix, ACE numbers, et cetera, et cetera, you get, uh, the, the result you get is the it's a situation of how it is actually announced in the internet. So this is an example. So this is a heat map, uh, one of the results you get from the uh, right start search. So we conducted a search for this, uh, for this address, which is the one for JPNIC office in Japan. And this is a heat map of an announced route. So the red indicates that there are less peers that have actually observed the, the announcements, and the green indicates the opposite. So moving on to the actual prefixes uh, search results. The first one was from an AS in Japan. It started in November uh, 2002, and it still is alive in 2020. And the next one was from an AES in South Korea, which started in 2008 of January, and then halted just last month. And the third one, this is the final one, so this started in 2005, April, and also stopped just last month. So, and these are the consequences of the detected networks. The first one, the one from an AES in Japan, it previously was returned to JPNIC, but apparently the announcement settings still did not, it has still not followed it yet, and it still is alive as a route. And secondly, the one from an ace in South Korea, it was withdrawn after contact, and it turned out to be a simple misconfiguration. And for the third one, the situation was exactly the same as this one. It was withdrawn after contact, and it was a simple misconfiguration. So uh, we found three 
unassigned networks are now seeing root information. And I believe that we can conclude that even a new IP address is the root in the internet, which is not an organization dependent problem, so it can be applied to any other country, any other organization. And these are the future works we can think of. First, I'm thinking of trying active monitoring. By active monitoring, I simply mean pinging them all. Or if you take a step farther, we can investigate open ports in the host in a detected IP networks to see their purposes. And maybe we can do some uh, search on IR database for more information if there's any interesting or peculiar entry in IRL, there might be a chance of it, a chance of the detected uh, prefix used for malicious purposes. And fourth, as I already stated in the last slides, uh, we can conduct for some further research for other regions. Or if we take other approach, uh, we can even do the research involving malicious domain names since I've heard from numerous sources that IP, hijack tech, IP hijacking technique is quite often used in combination with malicious domain names, which I think are useful phishing. And the last thing, this is our um, ideal. Well, there is no, there absolutely is no solid plan yet, but we're thinking of anomaly detection by machine learning using features such as A's path, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and here's the final slide. So uh, we've set up a public GitHub repository. Uh, it contains a simple Python script I wrote, and it is applicable to arbitrary IP prefixes for all. So if you have any interest in it, um, please give it a try. Um, that is it from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kentaro. Any questions for Kentaro? Please state your name, please. Hi, I'm uh, Tom Paseka from Hi. Cloudflare. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have kind of two statements and a question as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I've noticed in Japan especially, um, ISPs that have unused address space but allocated will always announce them um, because they found out that when they don't announce them um, that someone else will start announcing them. Oh. Um, so they always make sure that they have an active announcement and I think Maz may have given a talk on that um, last year or a couple of years ago. Um, the next one is I think tomorrow in the routing security session um, there is a session on using a RPKI, um, signing the unassigned routes to AS0. Oh, yeah. um, what, what's your thoughts on that? Do you think that JPNIC or others should actually set their bogons to AS0? I'm um, quite not sure about the RPKI system yet, but um, yeah, maybe I <laughs> should study a lot more about that. Um, uh, hi. Taiji from JPNIC. I'm in charge of the RPG service in JPNIC. Um, APNIC is trying to do their trial to serve the S0 ROA for uh, the trial on the side of ISP can detect or maybe drop the BZP route. Uh, specified by S0. But in JPNIC, um, currently we are not thinking of it. Um, the, actually, we have several S0 ROA, but it's uh, uh, kind of actual specification where uh, they are defining. It's a very interesting interesting idea to uh, automated way of uh, handling the AS0 roads, but we are not currently uh, thinking of it. Thanks. Any more questions for goto -san? Please state your name. Organization, please. Hi, my name is Warwick Mitchell. I'm from Arnet. Mm. I was wondering, you specifically mentioned IPv4. Mm. What's your research into IPv6 in this state? Uh, we still haven't done anything about the IPv6. Uh, there is no historic background about it, so uh, I don't 
think there is not much necessity for the research yet. But it is, it, is it something you're going to do? Um, still not thinking about it. Okay. Mm. Hi, Aftab Siddiqui. I just took a little respond to Warren um, uh, on this that um, I'll be doing a lightning talk on IPv6 Bourbon. So I would like you to be there because I only have two years of data. Mm. You have much longer data, so probably you can do something oh. much better. Right. Thank oh. you. Thank you very much. Cliff Houston, AP Nick. I've been running the Bogon report for about the last 15 years. I've been running the Bogon report for, for long enough, Warren, in V4, V6 and ASNs. It differs from some of the others that it doesn't just do the IANA blocks. It actually looked right inside the daily registry stats files and nominated anything that any of the five RIRs marked as reserved or available. In other words, held in the registry. And if it's held in the registry, irrespective of the reason, and I see it in routing, it's marked. That has a full set of history going back forever if you're willing to do that kind of data mining. Uh, and it reflects the entirety of all the V4, V6 and ASN. So if you want to do it, let me know and I'll tell you where. Okay. Uh, thank you, Goto-san. Let's give him a round of applause. Yep. Thank you. Uh, just a quick uh, announcement before I introduce the next speaker. Uh, we do have, it looks, I mentioned we have four uh, presentations in this session, but it looks like we have a bonus one added at the last minute. If you re reload the, uh, the page on the, on the session, you'll see another one has been added. Just to make sure, um, just to confirm, is Mel Choir from Juniper here? Can you raise your hand if you're here? Okay, well, well, we'll see how that goes. Um, okay, I would like to introduce the next uh, speaker. Uh, Warwick Mitchell from ARNet will talk about uh, why manners is important. Warwick. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Warwick Mitchell. Uh, I come from ARNet. If you want a history on ARNet, feel free to ask Jeff. Uh, considering he uh, was there 31 years ago. Uh, but we can talk about it. So I'm here to talk about manners. Now, manners can mean a lot of things to different people. If I go to my wife's family, manners refers to don't put chopsticks down in the bowl. Put them to the side. That's bad. Or it could be just simply saying please and thank you. So. Why is it important to us as network operators? Well, in this case, it refers to mutually agreed norms for routing security. So we're going to talk about that a bit more. But I guess a little bit of background on Arnet, even though I said to go talk to Jeff. We've been around for 31 years. Uh, basically, we're responsible for connecting the 38 universities of Australia plus CSIRO to the internet and global research networks. We have a fairly significant number of downstream uh, IP ranges that are connected to us. So you could consider us a service provider of sorts, but to the research and education sector. So I'm going to talk about manners, the repositories that you can use for, for getting some information. And I'll, I'll be up front. This is not a silver bullet. This takes work. We're going to talk about the facilitation of valid routing information at a global scale. Funnily enough, what we were just talking about through the last couple of sessions, preventing propagation of incorrect routing information, and we'll talk about some things there, and preventing traffic with spoofed IP addresses, and I know there's a lovely report that comes out about that as well, and again, how do we actually talk to each other? So, I'm going to refer to Jeff a few times here today, um, mainly because Jeff has a great presentation on BGP. It's all about there is no trust. Basically, I can say something to you and you basically have to accept it unless you put a policy on your side to say don't. So with that in mind, basically what we're seeing is that people are out there making typos, as we've talked about. We saw misconfiguration in Japan and Hong Kong. We've seen people deliberately try and hijack IP addresses. 
We've seen people make mistakes. We've seen routers with software make mistakes. And we see denial of service attacks and things like that that basically turn around and create reputational damage to people and to networks. These incidents could be from a global scale. They can also be from a domestic scale. They can even be down to a state or territory. Now, Manners came about, I want to say a few years ago, but it's more than that. And basically, it's a global initiative. And the idea is here that we can all do better. And that's my theme here, is that we all can do better, and we should. So that's what we're going to talk about. So again, the protocol was created long before I was born. Uh, it's based on the fact that uh, security was never a consideration. It was like, we trust each other. We're all good. It's small. Then as the internet has grown, as we've seen over the years, it has grown to a scale that just we can't trust what comes from blue, red, or green, as was referred to in the previous slides. There's no validations. And if you try to do BGP, security, AS, path, validation, and so forth, think about the compute. Think about the resources that are going to be required in your neighbor peering statements to go down all the way down the downstream level, especially when you start ingesting a full routing table. The trust chain, it's, it does span the globe. And as I said before, there's no silver bullet, lack of reliable, consistent data in the routing table, its origin, RADDB, various entities, it's, it's a problem. So this leads to various events. Now, I'm going to stop for a minute, and I'm going to talk about an event in 2012. Now, Jeff is laughing and smiling at me when I say this. It was actually eight years ago, within a day or two of today, that we actually had an event in Australia that was fairly significant. Those of you who don't know, uh, we had an issue where Dodo was learning routes from a company called Optus, the service provider, and they announced it to Telstra. Telstra trusted Dodo, and so they announced those routes to the rest of Telstra's network and Telstra's customers. Now, the interesting part is Telstra was also peered with Optus, but because Dodo was considered a customer, it treated the local pref as a higher value and therefore was considered the best path to these networks. Let's just say shit broke. Um, the result was a number of people on mailing this going, oh, I think that there's going to be some changes made within Telstra's routing table, and there wasn't. It was a case of, literally, it was two fingers being pointed at each other from various angles. Dodo was saying it's Telstra's fault, Telstra's going it's Dodo's fault. At the end of the day, it was everybody's fault. It came down to, Myself as a service provider, max prefix limits and so forth, actually going, right, we've got to actually drop this. We've got to stop it because it's impacting our customers. So this is why this is so important. And we're talking about things here where we talked about there's been the YouTube, which I'll talk about in a minute. There's been DDoS services and things all around the world. You cannot deny this is happening. It is a constant thing that's happening in our environment. So what if I told you that the library has every bit of information that you need. I'll be honest, I'm lying. But there's a good starting point. So the things that I want to talk about as part of the why manners is important is that you guys need to start looking at IRR data. If you're not automating your prefix generation, your AS path filtering, your communities, all of that information, then you're just creating more of a problem going forward. This is the time to start doing these sorts of things and actually fixing these up now. An example here, and I'm free to point out that Arnet is not any better than anyone else, is the fact that we have Arnet's AS7575-AS-RNO regional network, and it talks about all the downstream members that we have connected to Arnet in the RADDB database. Now, the thing that I'll point out here that's probably worthwhile pointing out is, look at the date. Last update was 2014. I can tell you why that was. We fixed a typo. But how often do you guys go back and actually check your data? This is the things that are important. Sorry, thank you. So, the next thing I want to talk about. Rowers, we've heard about rowers RPKPI, bits and pieces, it's actually important to do this. Now, there is a reason why I'll go through this in a minute and it'll explain a few things, but 
One of the things here is you can see that Arnett has, um, and I'm using our office space as an example, we've allocated ourselves through APNIC 202.6.112.0 slash 24, and we actually signed it within the APNIC system. We said the max length was slash 24, which makes common sense. It's a slash 24 network. And it's valid. That's a good thing. Then we go on to peering DB. Now, peering DB is actually really useful, and I, I, I really actually love it, especially the fact that it's got an API that you can query. Uh, I did a demonstration at a previous conference where within 20 minutes, I showed that you could generate your entire router BGP config for a, BG, a peering point with 60 lines of Python. Uh, now, I cannot recommend it enough, but again, the data has to be kept up to date. It's, the onus is on you. So you can see here where Arnett peers, we talk about our traffic, but the important bit is last updated. Now, admittedly, that was September last year, but it shows that we are paying attention to it. So, I love this picture because it's true. One simply doesn't walk into Mordor. There are three bus routes according to Google. What are you going to do? So, we talk about route hijacking. So, in 2008, which is obviously before the Telstra thing that I mentioned and the Dodo in, back in 2012, YouTube was hijacked. And this diagram kind of gives you an explanation as to why that occurred. Basically, uh, where is it? We had an issue where the hijackers announced a route and meant that the uh, YouTube traffic actually went to the hijackers instead of going to where it was meant to go. Now, Manners talks about how do we fix this? How do we implement changes to our way of operating to actually do things to resolve this? Now, you can do it via AS path is a good starting point. You can do prefix lists. You can do prefix limits. You can use RPSL. You can do route validation. Again, every little piece that you do helps you. This is why it's important. So, with that in mind, why was that important to Arnett? So, in 2018, Arnett had a slash 16 for one of its clients that was hijacked. Now, I'll be very clear, it was not malicious. However, we didn't know that at the time. Now, this is where it gets even better. So, the customer rang Arnett and said, we can't get to Google. We went, that's funny, everybody else is getting to Google, we're not seeing any problems. Anyway, so we logged in, had a look at our NetFlow data and saw that, okay, the customer was sending data to Google, but Google was not sending us any responses to the data from the customer. That's bad. So, a couple of things happened. One, we went and looked at the right database. We went and looked at the RIS data. No, there was no hijack. It was not in the global routing table. So what the hell's going on? We then went, hmm, that's a bit odd. So we then rang Google and said, Google, we have a university that is not working. They use you for mail. They use you for all of their content delivery for the uni. This is bad. You need to fix this. Google went, hmm, that's kind of bad. Let's respond. So Google sent an email back to me about two hours later with an actual route output. That route output told me everything I needed to know. The route output basically said, we've learnt this slash 16 from another ISP in the United States, and because they haven't got an AS path prepend on it, they're being preferred. So, the thing that came from that was a conversation with Google about the fact that, well, what is Google going to do about this in the future? Meanwhile, we had to fix the uni. So, first thing we did was have a look at, could we remove the additional AS path from our side to simplify it, to bring it so that they were equal? Short answer is no, because it still wouldn't beat the BGP selection process that Google was applying. So, first thing I did was say to Google, can you please filter this? Google said, get your customer to stop announcing it to us in the US. I turned around and said to Google, this university doesn't exist in the US, that's not them. Google's response, okay, well, yeah, we'll have to get someone to investigate it and we might be able to filter it in the next few hours. At this point, about 20-odd hours have gone by. So, being in, uh, a resourceful person, went and grabbed the Whois data for the AS that we knew was now announcing it, 
and contacted them. We sent them an email saying, hey guys, any chance this is a typo? Response we got back is, whoops. They stopped announcing it, Google traffic went back, the university was back online. This is why manners is important. The concept here is, and we can argue semantics about whether or not it's the right way to go, the wrong way to go and so forth, but if we improve our general hygiene of data, it will improve the internet. That's the important bit. So, with that in mind, what's another part of manners? The fact that you should not pass spoofed source traffic. So, again, I don't need to preach to the converted. You guys all know about how IP spoofing works, but for those that don't, the attacker basically says, oh, I found an open resolver, and this is where the internet is really useful with Google. You, there, are, there are actually lists that tell you who's got open DNS resolvers, which makes attacking you really easy. So then, with that, you go and send a message, the victim responds, and basically you denial of service attack the, uh, the person you want by basically spoofing your, the IP address. Now, again, as a service provider, there are fixes that you can do to make things better. You can turn on URPF. You can use ACLs. Now, URPF, if I go back 20 years of internet routing history, was a bad, bad word. It's not so bad now. We know what it does. It can be utilised. We should utilise it or an ACL automated to actually make sure that we are not allowing address spoofing. There are tools that help you with this. So one of the tools is by CADA. You can actually go and test yourself. And so as part of Manners, when you go and actually register for Manners, you actually are asked to go and run this tool in your own network. It's a great way to find when your ACLs and your automation is broken. Make sure that you're filtering everything. Don't just assume that if it's working for your office networks, it's working for your customers. So this is an example of the spoofing by country. And you can see here that Australia ranked, I think this was the top 20, uh, Australia ranked in there. But it's not a huge number, but it's there. What was interesting though is if you have a look at the numbers up here in Thailand for NAT and non-NAT, that's really big. Again, this is why we want to make sure that things are done correctly. So, for those of you who are not born in the 80s, this is a reference to Ghostbusters, obviously. And basically, we're talking about if there's something strange, who are you going to call? Well, your security is in someone else's hands. How do you actually fix this? Can you actually call someone? Do they know how, do they know how to call you? Is your data up to date? Now, I will admit, I realised I should have made an update to this slide. Uh, is your WHOIS data, or RDAP data, up to date? Is your IRR abuse contact details up to date? Are you checking that they are up to date? Is peering DB up to date? Are you telling people enough information to help them actually contact you and go, oh, I need to be able to do this? Because peering DB is great because it helps you go and actually say, oh, look, Arnett has 500 routes that are downstream of it. It used to have 1,000. Oh, maybe we should lower that. There are things that can be done. Again, is your data in IRR and RADDB, Merit, APNIC, I can continue on, up to date? Have you removed the routes you no longer route from your entries? This is probably the biggest problem with RADDB, is people just let things go stale. And as we heard from earlier today about JP Nick and the adventures they went through with trying to identify why their routes were being advertised, is people make misconfigurations and they forget to go and check. I cannot stress this enough. People need to go back and look again. So, I come back to the message I've been saying all along. We need to raise our expectations of each other to actually improve the situation. If we do this, everybody improves. Now, when I looked at the Manners uh, participants list yesterday, there were one ISP for Australia uh, that is solely Australia. There are two international companies that support Manners, but in Australia. There is one IXP. Now, I'm not going to name and shame people because there's no point. The reality is, is that you all should be engaged in manners. It's something you should do. It's good best practice. Now, I am going to mention that there is a manners conversation in M5 and M6 starting straight after this uh, during the lunch break. I believe they're having lunch in the room. 
If you would like to come and talk about manners and get more information, please do come and talk in that session. Raise your concerns because we, as a group, we have the ability to fix things. So, moving on to the final bit, rowers. Now, a lot of my points about this has just been stolen by the conversation we had before. So, route validation. So, in 2019, we saw an email that basically said, OK, AT&T is now dropping invalid prefixes. That was pretty big news on the Nanog mailing list. It caused a few people to go, ooh. And it made people go, should I sign things? How do I test it? How do I not test it? What do I do? So we've had a lot of conversations about RPKPI and rowers over the last few days. This is actually something that you can do. And I agree with the conversation that AS0 and using that to tag routes that should not be on the internet is not a bad idea. However, the problem is, is that we need people to actually be dropping invalids. If they don't drop invalids, it's useless. But it's a good starting point. But again, how can we all improve things? Now, route validation, I've, we've seen this before, but there are tools out there to help you. Uh, this one is being deprecated, I'll admit it. BGP Mon was bought by Cisco, so I'm not sure what they're going to turn it into, but it has a message saying it may be going away. But if you look here, the role was successfully applied and valid. That's a good thing. This is a deliberate thing by myself where I tagged the route with the wrong ASN in the rower table within APNIC. Now, I did that just to see what I would get out of it. Also, it's an office. I didn't really care if they had no internet. So what I did is I tagged it as 7570, which is one of our other ASs, and said, OK, it's covered by the slash 16 with 7575 with a max prefix length of slash 24. So it's still a valid route on the internet. It's just that the very specific route is an invalid. This gives me the ability to test a few things to make sure things are working. Now, I wish this was actually a live demonstration of my network. It's not. Um, I believe Aaron's going to show you this working for Rianza's network tomorrow, or it is tomorrow that you're talking? After lunch, OK. So, but this shows you a test tool that you can use. Uh, I believe uh, that this is now, or sorry, it is publicly known. Um, this allows you to test whether or not your routes will pass from an RPKPI perspective and that your provider or yourself is doing the right thing. Are you dropping invalids? Obviously, smiley face, it's all good. The bad one is when you don't get the smiley face. So again, I come back to the very beginning, which I said, it's all about us working together to improve things. Now, if we all just took a little bit of time to do a little data, bit of data clean, clean, sorry, cleanliness, and you know, auditing, we would actually improve things. We'd have less fat fingers, we'd have, we'd have a way of dealing with things. But again, it's not a silver bullet. People can still get around these things, but it's a good place to go. So I highly encourage you to join the Manners Initiative and to be actively engaged in how to test that it's working. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ward. Uh, any questions for Ward? Come on, Tom. <laughs> um, not, not a question, but a comment on that. Um, AT&T filter, filtering RPKI invalids, a rower invalids, is actually really, really important. So last year, we had a route hijack. Um, a BGP optimizer thinks that shouldn't exist, but unfortunately, they do. Um, created a whole lot of more specific prefixes than we have um, which were invalid routes. Um, we have exact matches on our rowers, and so they should have been dropped. Um, a very large ISP in the US, which does not implement RPKI at all, couldn't reach any of those prefixes at that time. Um, but AT&T were completely fine. They were not impacted by that because of them dropping invalids. So it's incredibly important to do. It's not just protecting your own network. It's protecting your network's access to others. Well, and I'll, I'll just add to that. It's also viciously taking that data and trying to get, learn something about your network or your client's networks. It is highly important. So yes, I 100% agree. P please Susan say your Barney name. Barney from oh. Hurricane Electric. I had a question about the, uh, the, the route uh, hijack or accident that you had with the slash 16 from one of your customers. 
Was that really a slash 16 advertisement? Yes, it was. Why didn't you just advertise a less specific route to get around it? That was or a more specific route, rather, to get around it. There was an option to do that. And the, when the customer, so what I didn't say in the slide is the customer took 18 hours to come to us. We determined what was going on in the last two hours and went, hmm, OK. And we went through the process. Now, the, the, the counter, well, not the counterpoint, but the perspective from us was we could break the customer's network down, but because they were announcing it from their AS, we would have to go and break in and actually say, right, we're going to announce it as us, which meant we had to go and update filters around the world, and that uh, in the sense of us originating it, because our filters had us as a transit, not as a termination. So we could have done it, but it would have taken more than the six hours that it took to resolve the problem in the end. So, but yes, you're right, we could have done that. The university uh, engineers didn't feel comfortable making that change. No, I wouldn't have either. That would have been kind of naughty. So, but it would have worked. And in fact, I've just noticed, looking at some stuff a moment ago on the bgp.he uh, website, one of our customers has de, uh, de aggregated an entire slash 16. Um, and I'm looking at it going, why, guys? And the reason being is they've gone, eh, why not? And I've gone, hmm, we should go and fix that. Well, thank you very much for your talk. No worries. All right, Tashi, hit me with it. <laughs> uh, Tashi from Apenic. Warwick, uh, because you're special, because you provide transit for probably the maximum holders of historical address space, most of your clients are universities, uh, rowers for them, are you having difficulties trying to, tr just, just wanted to know. Um, short answer is the biggest challenge is getting them to understand the, the risk they face. Once we've, exp and I've, I've been talking about this with the universities for three years. In the three years I've been raising this, we have had three universities actually apply rollers to their network, uh, which, is a, which is actually kind of on par for how long things take um, with universities. But uh, you're right, it is one of the questions that I spent a lot of time talking with yourself and others about was the fact that our customer base is historical records that have been transferred from Aaron from all over the place and it does make it harder to deal with. But uh, so far, people have said to us, yeah, that sounds like a really good idea. Let's put it on the list. But the list is 20 lines long before we even get to it. So um, yes, it is something that I keep pushing our customers to do. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Warwick. No worries. Let's give him a round of applause, please. Uh, just a quick comment on, uh, I have to apologize for the confusion I mentioned before introducing work that we had another presentation. It looked like it was just a mistake, not a last minute ad. So this, that concludes the session for today. Um, got 10 minutes additional back. Thank you.